Our second reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Hear now the word of the Lord. They came to the other side of the sea, into the land of the Gerasenes. When Jesus stepped off the ship, immediately a man came out from the tombs to meet him, a man with an unclean spirit. He had been making his home among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Many times men had tried to bind him in shackles and chains, but he had broken all, and no man could restrain them. Every night and every day he was in the mountains and would cry out and cut himself with stones. Yet, when this man saw Jesus, even from far away, he ran to pay him homage. With a loud voice he cried, saying, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had said to the man, Come out of him, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And the answer came, Call us legion, for we are many. The spirits told Jesus not to send them out of the countryside, but near the mountains there was a great herd of swine grazing. So all the spirits called out and said to Jesus, Send us into the swine, that we may enter them. Jesus did allow this. And immediately the unclean spirits did go out from the man and enter into the swine. The herd of two thousand ran violently down a steep cliff to the sea and were drowned. The swine herders fled and told this story in the city and in the country, and people went out to see what it was that had happened. And they came to see Jesus, and the man who had been troubled by an unclean spirit called Legion, but the man was sitting and fully clothed and clearly of sound mind, and they were amazed and afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the man with the unclean spirit and to the swine told their story. They begged Jesus to leave the land. When Jesus boarded the ship, the man who had borne the unclean spirit asked him, if he might come along and be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Go back to your home, and keep telling the story of how the Lord has done great things for you, and shown you compassion. So the man turned back, and began to proclaim in Decapolis what Jesus had done for him, so that all were amazed. This is the word of the Lord. This uh, isn't exactly one of the most popular gospel stories. Our worship series for the summer, Unraveled, has been looking at stories in the Bible about times when people's lives fell apart and they turned to God. This is definitely a story of a man's life being unraveled and woven back together by Jesus' hands. This isn't a popular gospel story, or at least it certainly isn't a popular one in Presbyterian churches, but it is a gospel story nonetheless. And while it's in some ways an uncomfortable story, it's also a reminder that Jesus seeks us out and finds us when we are in uncomfortable places. One of many themes throughout the Bible is the idea of people, things, and animals being clean or unclean. Even today we know that some religious groups consider certain foods unclean, which is why many Jews and Muslims won't eat pork. It's a bit harder to grasp the rules under which people are clean or unclean, and it's nearly impossible to find a modern analogy. Being unclean was, for the vast majority of people, 
a temporary condition. It didn't mean that you were completely shunned by and cast out from your community forever, but it did mean that you weren't considered prepared to enter the temple or to take part in rituals. If you had a skin condition of any kind, or if you were on your period, or if you would come into contact with a dead body, for example, you were asked to stay away from the temple and from community life for a certain amount of time, varying between a few hours and 80 days, depending on the category of unclean. Being unclean wasn't the same thing as having committed a grave sin, but the rules were meant to remind people that entering God's presence in the temple required very careful preparation and was never to be done without the utmost respect. So when we talk about the man in today's story being unclean, we don't mean that he was exiled for a crime or that he was being persecuted for not fitting in or that he had chosen to live in solitude as a hermit, or that he was necessarily literally dirty. He wasn't able to take part in the life of his community, which must have been very lonely, and probably didn't help his state of mind. He spent his days crying out and cutting himself with stones. For whatever reason, in his mind, he just can't fit in or take part in the expectations of society. The translation that I read just now is one that I wrote, and I described him as having an unclean spirit, mostly because after racking my brain and bugging all my Greek language nerd friends, I can't come up with a better wording. The word pneuma does mean spirit and is also used for the Holy Spirit, but it's a word with multiple meanings. It is life force or the rational mind or the soul or breath or even wind. What is unclean is the man's very essence. He feels broken and that makes him weep and wail and hurt himself. It's hard to talk about things that we can't see or even really imagine. Aside from the injuries he had caused to himself, we're not told that he looked visibly unclean. I, I used to have very painful eczema on my hands for years that would have rendered me ritually unclean, but today I could show my hands at the temple door as evidence. I'm so grateful that I have normal people hands again. <laughs> but without an MRI, you can't very well show someone your brain. And yet Jesus, who sees all things, can see the man's mind and recognizes that the man needs to be healed. Whether the man suffered from an invisible disability or from mental illness or from a neurological condition or whatever else, Jesus looked past his loneliness and his tears and his erratic behavior and saw him as nothing less than exactly what he was, a beloved child of God. The man looks at Jesus, even from far away, and sees him for who he is too. He runs towards Jesus, he bows before him, he names him as being the Son of God. But in the same breath, he begs to be left alone. On the one hand, he wants to be healed, but on the other hand, he resists it. Because sometimes the numbness of depression is easier to live with than the heavy weight of the world around us. Sometimes it's easier to lock ourselves away than to face the judgment of others. Sometimes the very concept of change is too terrifying to even acknowledge. Sometimes the whole world falls away and all that you are left with is your fear or your grief or your anger or your doubt 
And it feels impossible to imagine that there could ever be anything better. No matter how desperately you wish and hope that there might be. But there is something better. Jesus mends the man's broken heart, his unraveled mind, the crack in his soul. And suddenly there he is, sitting and talking with Jesus, opening himself up to someone and being treated as a person for the first time in quite a while. I don't believe in demonic possession. I don't believe that our loving God who made every cell and atom and element in existence and gave us free will would have created supernatural entities capable of ripping us away from God's love. I don't think that we humans need any help in that area. Sometimes we find ourselves in uncomfortable places, whether that's by circumstance of birth or by genetic lottery or by a chemical imbalance or by our own choices or by the actions of others or because there's a pandemic going on and we are all living in the heavy loneliness of isolation. That isn't evil. That's just the world we live in. But wherever we are, Jesus will seek us out and find us there. In some ways, it feels a little disingenuous to lift up the stories of Jesus' healing miracles during a pandemic, with over 800,000 deaths and some 23 million confirmed cases around the globe. But miracles are complicated, and sometimes they don't come easily, as is certainly apparent in this story. Even so, Jesus looks into our souls and sees who we are, no matter how the world sees us. He challenges us to view the world the way he does, to see that all people are beloved children of God, and that all people are worthy of grace. <laughs>